So thanks, Eddie, for inviting me. No, no, no pressure on the anticipation. Uh, in case I run out of time, I always like to begin with my most important slide, which is to acknowledge the people who helped me with the work that I did, although almost nothing in this talk is my work. It's all done by people 100 years ago. But Lee will pay my salary. For actually, currently, um, a lot of it is the Protein Structure Initiative. And actually, my thesis advisor, Tom Albert, who created the B-Mine I work at, uh, he very sadly passed away only a few months ago. But when I was a grad student in his lab, he was involved in a pilot project for PSI, and that uh, enabled me to write something called ELSE, which was a program that maybe you've, you've heard about. So PSI supported me throughout my entire scientific career. And uh, that will end next year, and that will begin my age of uncertainty. But <laughs> the age of uncertainty I want to talk to you about today is something that happened almost exactly 100 years ago this month, which is the collapse of determinism. So quantum theory tells us, and we're, we've accepted more or less now, that the, so science up until 1914 was based on the fundamental assumption that the future is predictable. And if you understand the rules of how nature works and the current situation, you can predict the future. And that's something that we all, a lot of us still like to believe. But it was in 1914 when that really was called into question. And it was this paper by Dubai where he puts these important pieces together. A lot of these numbers only just became available at that time. But the critical paradox is that atoms, even though there's electrons orbiting them that are clearly accelerating, they're not emitting radiation, which they should be, which he described as being contrary to fundamental principles. This is something that we rely on today because it is what, in fact, makes the x-rays we use for crystallography. Uh, the electrons orbiting around a synchrotron emit light. And Dubai actually calculated that the lifetime of the universe should be about 10 nanoseconds before the electron spins into the, into the nucleus and forms powdered neutronium out of all of creation. So the fact that that doesn't happen means that there's something wrong with physics. And this must have been absolutely, uh, uh, it must have been so distressing to Dubai. I mean, he only got his PhD a few years earlier. And suddenly he's faced with looking at everything he that everything about physics seems to be going to hell. Uh, something that happened only a few months before was this. Uh, the Archbishop Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in, in both in, uh, in Yugoslavia. And so the, not just science, but the whole rest of the world seemed to be going crazy. So it's interesting to think, to try and place yourself in that historical context. So who were the players in 1914? Well, I'm not going to list every scientist there, but Dubai was 31 years old, a uh, young, uh, young postdoctoral student. His colleague, Scherer, who was, who was described as being Scherer's tutor, who they would go, uh, go on to resolve this, uh, or this paradox later on, uh, was not much, uh, not much younger than him. Einstein was around, and he was a relatively young man at that time. And so was Lorentz. Now Lorentz, not many people appreciate this, is the guy who derived all the mathematical foundations that Einstein used for relativity. Uh, the Lorentz factor, the, the Lorentz contraction, the Lorentz transfer, all those things, the same guy. He also schooled Dubai on a few things, which I'll tell you about in a bit. Uh, also, a close friend of Einstein, who met, he met in Berlin, was Maxwell Lowy. And they, uh, they met uh, in Berlin before Lowy went to, uh, went to work in, Paul, in Summerfield's lab, where he met Paul Peter Ewald, uh, then a young PhD student. And this conversation of theirs in the park is what supposedly led to uh, the diffraction patterns and Nobel Prizes there. Ewald's the same age as Charles Darwin Darwin and Henry Mosley. And uh, Gold, uh, this is not the Charles Darwin you're thinking of. This is the grandson of the Origin of Species guy. And he worked out a lot of the quantitative fundamental theories of crystallography as we know it. Both of them were students of Rutherford, who was uh, the Cavendish professor at Cambridge. At that time, he succeeded J.J. Thompson, the guy who discovered the electron. And he was actually one of his students. Uh, the other uh, Cavendish professors were Lord Raleigh, you know, Raleigh scattering before him, and James Clark Maxwell, who uh, had died very young, but he was still very influential in his time. Rutherford was succeeded by Lawrence Pratt, who, along with his father, needs no introduction. Uh, Central to all this was Rankin. He was actually wrote, he was, uh, in the 70s at, uh, in 1914. And you may notice there aren't too many women on this graph, but Marie Curie was still alive and well at the time. In fact, she had a good 10 years left in her, even after all the radiation that she'd been exposed to. 
And Dorothy Crowfoot was around and active, although um, not really crystallographically active just yet. So you can complain that there aren't too many women on this slide, but something that bugs me is there's not too many Americans either. Uh, I throw in Edison and Tesla for reasons I'll show you in a moment, and also Arthur Compton, who's one of the, uh, he's got Compton's gathering name for him. And it's one of Compton's papers that really put this into perspective for me. Uh, this is a letter to nature. And this is back in the day when a letter to nature was literally a letter to nature. It was usually less than a page. And he describes a paper from Darwin, which has just reached us. That paper was published a month earlier, before he even started writing this. So you know, there was no, you know, these days in the beginning of the 21st century, we get annoyed when we have to wait for the online pre-release of something that isn't even written on paper yet. But in those days, it had to not just be printed on the paper, but it had to be loaded onto a boat, shipped across the Atlantic, and then probably taken on a wagon train or something before it got to having someone actually read it. So it was a big delay. And so a lot of things were going on at the same time that no one even knew was going on because it takes time for papers to move around. And it's actually efforts to solve that problem that led to some, uh, some of the technology I'm about to tell you about. Uh, in particular, to make x-rays, you need high voltages. And but the problem is, so the Van de generators and static electricity have been around for a very long time, and high voltages are easy to achieve. You can make 20,000 volts just by rubbing your feet on the floor, but there's not much current. And in order to get appreciable x-rays, you need both. And this made a lot of current. This slide wouldn't be nearly as entertaining. <laughs> so I'll tell you about electricity. In order to get voltage and current together, you need to make a battery. And uh, uh, Volta was the first one to make voltaic piles. You can get much above 60 volts, though, probably because it starts to really hurt when you do that, because everyone always touched the terminals in those days. But the actual kilovolt levels you need to make x-rays weren't achieved until uh, the invention of the induction coil. And as Nicholas Coulomb was the first one to make a really powerful one. Uh, so this is, again, high currents and high voltages. But no one really appreciated that this could make electromagnetic waves. It was only until Maxwell predicted that this should that people started to try and test Maxwell's theories. And this came along where Hertz uh, was just more or less in, uh, academically interested. Marconi and Tesla, though, realized the commercial potential for this. And this is what fueled the high voltage power supply, is telecommunications technology in its infancy. Uh, where Einstein came in was in realizing the significance of something Maxwell calculated, which is that the speed of light is a fundamental constant in physics. And it's independent of your reference frame. So if you have an electron that starts to move, and you're very far away from it, uh, the field only can propagate at the speed of light, and that creates a discontinuity, which is an electromagnetic wave. And that Doppler shift is what makes synchrotron radiation possible. It would all be infrared if we didn't have the relativistic effects kicking it up in the X-ray range. So you need two things to make X-rays. You need electricity, but you also need a good vacuum. Now vacuum technology, suction pumps, have actually been with us since antiquity. Um, but none of them were much better than the vapor pressure of water, because water was the working fluid that was being used. Uh, this is another uh, Google Doodle where these uh, Mundaberg hemispheres that classically were, there's no actual photograph of it, but they made, they made these two hemispheres that uh, two teams of horses couldn't pull apart after sucking most of the air out of it. But it's still not that like, great of a vacuum. It wasn't until 1865 when the mercury fault pump was invented. And this is a pump where you really just pour mercury into the top, it grabs a little gulp of gas and then falls down to the bottom. And it's, it's long enough so that you can have hard vacuum up here and the atmosphere down here. And the way the mercury keeps up with it. Uh, Sprangle was the one who really perfected this. And the, the important consequence of that was the electric light. These pressures, 10 to the minus 3 or more torr, is what Edison needed to make his light bulbs last long enough to be commercially viable. And that triggered a tremendous uh, uh, effort in vacuum technology. And uh, believe it or not, yeah, these are real signs that were posted in hotel rooms. Because apparently there were some interface failures with people who weren't used to the type of technology and had to be reminded of that. But this was a huge commercial boom. And so it drove vacuum technology. Sprinkle pumps eventually got down in, even into the sixes. And it's where you cross the barrier of about 10 to the 5 is where cold cathodes start to work. And that's where the Coolidge tubes that, uh, like the one that Rankin used, became possible. Uh, the current world record set in 1993 is 10 to the minus 14 torr, uh, which is the best vacuum I've achieved yet here on Earth. So Rankin uh, 
used one of these coolidge tubes. And I was trying to find a picture of the actual tube they used, because the problem with these tubes is they are made of glass. You're seeing the glow here of these are electrons coming down the tube, and they're being shadowed by a mica figure. Usually it was this uh, cross. And you're seeing the glow of the glass itself at the end. And these were sort of party demonstrations for, uh, uh, for different types of vacuum tubes. But x-rays can't really go through glass very well. And there was a guy named Leonard, uh, Paul Leonard, who actually won a Nobel Prize a, a few years later, who, in, who was famous for making aluminum windows in vacuum tubes. And uh, thin enough to try to let the cathode rays out, or, which are, we now know are electrons, but also probably x-rays. And in his Nobel lecture is this drawing. Where he claims that Rankin was one of the first people to use one of them. And he very graciously gives him credit for that discovery. I think Leonard may have been a bit jealous that he waited a few years for his Nobel. But uh, Rankin was the first Nobel Prize uh, of, of all. And he used the two, apparently just like this one, to make his famous photographs of hands and, and such. So that enabled Lowy to make this famous photograph from uh, 1912. And this supposedly came from a conversation with Ewald. So he was doing sort of a sabbatical with Summerfield and talked to this young PhD student about his doctoral thesis while they're walking through the park. Now, Ewald's thesis became about X-ray diffraction, but when he started, it wasn't what it was about at all. He was actually looking at optical things, visible light interacting with periodic lattices. It's interesting. So this is, these are his words. So 1910, when I began work on my thesis, there was no quantitative proof for the internal periodicity of crystals. 1910. No one was really sure that they were actually ordered rays of atoms. And the thing he was trying to do that Sommerfield suggested was predict a double refraction, where you, the lattice somehow causes the uh, optical pho photon to turn over on itself. As far as I know, this actually doesn't really happen. But he had been set to work doing that by, by Summerfield. Fortunately, I guess, he got kind of scooped on his theory by, by Lowy and changed his direction to then formulate what is now Ewald's dynamical theory of X-ray refraction. But he didn't start out his thesis that way. <coughs> now, something that you know, everyone got scooped by this, even the Braggs, and everyone was scrambling after this happened to publish papers trying to add something new, because Lowy had actually done a pretty good job of explaining everything. The one thing that was puzzling was the shape of the spots. Now, nowadays we know this is mosaic spread, but they didn't even know what that was in, in, in 1912. But you have, and what's going on is the crystals aren't really very well ordered. They're rotating around the beam. And so you get these streaks that are all the same V-spacing, but different, slightly different angles. And it, but it was looking at these spots that a young Lawrence Bragg decided to try and interpret them. And this actually came up at the uh, Bragg Symposium in Adelaide, where this was a, a figure from his, his lecture to the uh, Cambridge Philosophical Society. And this is believed to be the very first diagram of Bragg's law, where he models the crystal as a row of diffraction gratings, with a diverging beam coming off that's being focused up onto the detector, and that's why the spots are narrower than they are wide. What was really striking to me, this is wrong. Crystals don't focus x-rays. I mean, I'm a beamline scientist. I'd love it if they did, but they don't. So Bragg actually got that wrong. I mean, he got the angle right. So Bragg's law is, in fact, right. And that's, this is the first paper where that appeared. But he got the divergence part of it wrong. And I say, let this be a lesson to the young, the young scientists out there. It's OK to be wrong. If you have a great idea, throw it out there. Your achievements will be remembered forever, and your failures will fade into obscurity, eventually. <laughs> Brad was 23 years old when he did this, so not bad for a young kid. Now, Brad's father uh, actually made a really important contribution as well. He didn't just build the equipment, he invented, more or less, the x-ray detector. People had been using film up until then, but Brad, he didn't really invent it, but he perfected the ion chamber. And this was the first way to really electrically measure the x-ray beam, quantitatively. And this so it went from being a phenomenological experiment to a quantitative experiment. That was Henry Bragg's biggest contribution. And something else that they did, which I think is instructive to this day, is the spectrometer used a really big, thick crystal, much thicker than you could really get x-rays all the way through. And so this is called Bragg geometry, where you reflect an x-ray beam off the surface of a crystal. 
Now, now that we're starting to think about sulfur sat and really long wavelengths and big crystals with that much penetration depth, maybe this is something we should be returning to. So back to my chart again, these two guys, Darwin and Mosley, used Bragg's ion chamber to electrically measure the X-ray beam and came up with the actual theory. So uh, Mosley was sort of the lab monkey and uh, Dar Darwin was a theoretician. And they were working together and came up, collected all the data they needed and did all the derivations to come up with the dynamical theory as well as eventually the kinematical theory of X-ray diffraction, where you can quantitatively predict what the intensity of a given bright spot's going to be given a structure factor and some other parameters. In fact, Bragg, uh, Darwin was the first one to use the letter F to describe the structure factor. He didn't call it that at the time, but F was his invention. Something else Mosley did is while he was doing all this work, he was trying out different anodes. And what you find with different nanomaterials is they emit what's called characteristic radiation, or what we call K-alpha radiation now. And this is the periodic table as it appeared at his time. Can anyone see what's wrong with it? And that's one. Yeah. And nickel and cobalt and yep. fluorine and ida were in the wrong order as well. So why were they in the wrong order? Well, I didn't really notice this until I started looking into it, but argon is heavier than potassium. Yeah. Its atomic weight is bigger, even though its atomic number is lower. Now, the atomic number is something that Mendeleev invented to just sort the elements into some sort of order that he thought they should belong in. And Mendeleev actually insisted that these atomic weights had to be wrong. Because otherwise, you know, yeah. argon clearly is a noble gas, and potassium clearly belongs with the other alkali metals. But Mosley is the one who figured it out. The atomic number is almost exactly proportional to the k-alpha wavelength. How do you know the wavelength? You use Bragg's law. Remember, the neutron wasn't discovered until about 20 years later. And that explains the discrepancies in the atomic weights. But Bragg's law gives, if you have a given d-spacing, he was using mica mostly, and a given angle, you can tell what the wavelength is. And that's how he figured, that's how he arranged the periodic table. Uh, Mosley, after doing both of these things, a uh, war had just broken out. And like a lot of young men of his day, it was a manly thing to do was to go off to war when he had the opportunity. And so he ended up going to the Battle of Gallipoli. Uh, he was a supply sergeant. And he was on the phone calling in an order when a sniper shot him in the head. He was 27 years old. Now, Nobel Prizes aren't awarded posthumously, but I think he deserved two. <clears throat> so another question, though, which is important for this story I'm telling, is how do you exactly weigh an atom? I mean, we have mass spectrometers now. That wasn't invented until later, though, by Thompson, actually. But one thing you can do is use electricity. So if you run electric current through water, it, you, know, you can electrolyze things. And electrolysis has been around for a long time. John Dalton, actually, was the first person to use this as long with the ideal gas law, to assign ratios of masses between the elements. And he assigned one to hydrogen because it was the lightest. And that's a unit that now bears his name, one Dalton. It's the weight of a hydrogen atom. That was ratios. You can also measure how much of an anode disappears as you electrolyze it. You can weigh it. And so you can relate the deflection on an ampmeter, of whatever units you like, to the amount of mass that disappears from different elements. That gives you Faraday's constant which is the number of coulombs of electricity, and coulombs another guy at the time, but the number of coulombs corresponds to one mole of charge. And one mole of charge is enough to dissolve X amount of some material. That actually had all been worked out. And in fact, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1914 was given to T.W. Richards, who uh, had been redetermining a lot of atomic masses by these sorts of techniques. But it wasn't until Robert Milliken in 1910 who weighed oil droplets and measured their charge in an electric field, where he was able to actually measure the charge in a single electron. And knowing that lets you deconvolute Faraday's law and gives you Avogadro's number. So before Milken, we really didn't know what Avogadro's number was. But by measuring Avogadro's number in the charge electron, you're effectively weighing atoms. And that is what Debye needed in order to calculate just how big atoms are. If you know how big atoms are, you don't even need to know even cell constants. You just need to weigh a crystal to know how many atoms are in it. And from that, you can tell how far apart they are. And this became important. I'm going to take you a bit further back in time right now to ancient Greece. So in Greek, the word amber uh, means that, which is um, 
Uh, if you're a scientist in Greece, you find yourself doing this, you can sound it out. E -o -e -o. Electro is the Greek word for amber. And it's been known since antiquity that if you take wool, which is also a common material the ancient Greeks had, and rub it on a piece of amber, you can get uh, charge separation. If you rub it on glass or other materials, you actually get the opposite effect. So the positive charges go on glass, whereas the negatives go on the amber. And there's all these triple electric series that people have come up with over the years to describe how these different rubbing different materials gives you different separations. And people knew about this for a long time. And it was around the uh, 1730s or so that it was decided these were two different fluids. So you had resinous, meaning resin like amber, and vitreous were the two electric fluids. And later on, in the 1750s, these were assigned positive and negative by uh, there was a guy named Benjamin Franklin who imagined that these are not two different fluids, they're one fluid at different pressures. So positive pressure means high pressure, and negative pressure is low pressure, and positive flows to negative. That's what Franklin assumed. He got it wrong. Electrons actually go the other way. But that, that was a prevailing idea at the time, is the nature of electricity. And also, static electricity and ammo electricity and battery electricity it wasn't fully appreciated until the late 1800s, but these are all different forms of the same thing. Now, the reason why I'm telling you this is to make it seem not so stupid that in 1870, the dominant model for the atom proposed by Lord Kelvin was a vortex in space. And because if you have a vortex, you have low pressure in the middle and higher pressure outside of it, and that explains why you have positive and negative charges in an atom. It's pushing fluid around. This was back when the ether was still considered possible. So another Thompson, Lord Kelvin was a Thompson, so was J.J. Thompson, no relation. But Thompson championed this model, but when he discovered the electron, which you can call electron, he called it a corpuscle, but that the negative charge was in extremely small sizes. But he still reasoned that, well, the atom has to have positive charge surrounding those negative charges, because we know they move. And if they're moving and not emitting radiation, there has to be some way to cancel that somehow. And he imagined that these positive charges sort of belonged onto the negative charges as they moved around inside the atom. And this was a popular idea up until 1906. And that's around the time when Ernest Rutherford, or actually a couple of the students, and yes, this is Geiger, of the Geiger counter thing, uh, they did something to shrink the atom uh, by several orders of magnitude by using something Madame Curie found. Uh, Curie discovered radium, or radium and its alpha particles, and they bombarded uh, gold foil with alphas. And they found to their surprise that almost all the alphas go straight through, and every once in a while one of them bounces in a completely random direction. Now the interpretation of this is that the atom's nucleus, the positive charge, must be extremely small. Now to give you some idea of how, in a more modern context what that means, if you have some distribution of scattering material in real space, and in reciprocal space, you, you also get the Fourier transform of that. So Fourier transform of a Gaussian is another Gaussian. But if the atom spreads out, or if your charge is blurry, then you only get forward scattering. Those of you who work on membrane proteins should be familiar with this. <laughs> but if you get the other way around, really sharp atoms, then this, the intensity doesn't change much with resolution. And if you get mathematically perfectly sharp atoms, it shouldn't change at all. This is what Lowry predicted the scattering from atoms should look like. That all the charge can't be in orbit, otherwise it'd be emitting radiation. So it must still be stuck to the nucleus somehow, and something else is keeping atoms really far apart. That's with the prediction, but not the observation. This comes down to what we now know of as B factors. So we apply B factors to atoms, and this is what the actual electron distribution around carbon atom looks like with a B factor of 20, averaged over the crystal. And what was the last bastion of trying to hold on to, the, to the atoms not being having finite size was that thermal fluctuations must be causing atoms to appear much bigger than they are. That's what's causing your high angle spots to go away. It's disorder in the crystals. And this is what different B factors look like. And even if you get a B factor of zero, the atom still has some finite width. And it never gets smaller than that. This was the end of determinism. Now, Dubai's paper in 1914, where he actually measured this effect, and yes, liquid air had been available for over 100 years at this time, so he measured, eventually got down to measuring diamond, which is a very well-ordered crystal 
but still found that there's a residual, what he called zero point energy, which is a fancy physics way of saying there's something left over even after you hit zero. And later on, uh, uh, another interesting thing I found was this paper almost immediately afterward by Henry Bragg, father, where he summarizes Debye's paper. It took me a while to figure out that's the, the Dutch spelling. They don't have a Y. So, so, and for some reason, Bragg decided to spell it uh, in the Dutch way. But he summarized Bragg's very large equations that were temperature dependent with an A and a B. I believe this is the first time in the literature where the B factor was given the letter B. Divide never used that. He always used E to the minus M, where M was this really complicated expression. He never used a B. This isn't B the way we know it. There's a, a lambda missing. But I'm sure it's just a happy coincidence that Bragg's last name begins with that letter. <laughs> <laughs> Something else that was in this paper, so not only was it to find the B factor, not only did it bring an end to determinism, but it's also the only reference the original reference for the Lorentz factor. And Dubai writes that uh, during printing of this manuscript, A.J. Lorentz sent me a letter, I think Lorentz may have reviewed it or something, and told him about a factor he forgot. And the fa Lorentz factor comes from the fact that not every, no x-ray beam is perfectly monochromatic, and as you're rotating crystals, you know, they spend different times moving in and out of. Those of you who are working on Excel processing software, does this sound familiar? Yeah. Dubai forgot about it too. But Lorentz reminded him. And yes, this is the Lorentz factor. It's a paper by Dubai, but this is Lorentz's input. <coughs> so back to the follow-up paper, where Dubai laments the uh, fact that, that atoms don't emit radiation. This is the problem. He had enough numbers now. He knew how big the electron was. He knew the charge on the electron. He also knew how big atoms were by his work that he'd done lowering the temperature and extrapolating to zero temperature. The atoms are still 10,000 times bigger than the nucleus that Rutherford found. So electrons must be in orbit. And, but they can't be in orbit because otherwise they'd be emitting radiation. The only explanation is that the electron has to be everywhere at once. And if it's everywhere at once, it's indeterminate. That's the end of determinism as far as the quantum mechanical world goes. It's something that he struggled with. Einstein never wanted to believe it. He said, God no, doesn't play dice with the universe. Uh, that's one thing Einstein was wrong about. But at this level, this is the limit of what physics can predict. And it was in 1918 when uh, Dubai and Scherer finally wrote a paper uh, admitting that they couldn't really find any other explanation. And this was the, the end of that story, really, that atoms actually do have size. And we've learned a great deal about them since then. But it took a long time to really accept that. The last nail in the coffin of determinism was actually diffraction. So the electron was something a lot of people believed had to be a particle. And it was 1928 when the davidson germer experiment showed that you could diffract electrons off of a nickel crystal. And there were other experiments, all different versions of the young double slit experiment. But the way this all works is sort of like this. This is my diagram of what a Fourier transform looks like. So if you had a detector, that was really, really small, small, as comparable to the size of atoms. And you had two atoms sitting on the surface of that detector. This is the pattern you would see. This is what you expect from particles. If there's two holes, two points of emission, you should see two points of light. But if those holes move further away, this is a, to scale, you eventually start to see it's not just two blown up patterns of light, there's these fringes in between. And they correspond to 20, there's actually 20 of them. And the, they, they correspond to when the distance from this atom to that pixel to the other atom is an integral number of wavelengths. That's when they constructively interfere. This is called the near field. And as they move further and further away, you end up with the standard interference pattern. So the expectation of the particles is you can still see two dots, no matter how far away they are. But if, they're, if they really are wave mechanical objects, then you see an interference pattern. And that was the last nail in the coffin of determinism. So one last person I wanted to mention about, I have, I have time, I think I do, is moving a bit further forward after Dorothy grew up. Uh, she was the one of the first, for, first two people to get a diffraction pattern from a macromolecule. And there was a very critical insight in achieving that. On exposure to air, 
Birefringence goes away. Dorothy noticed that under a microscope. And then the diffraction goes down. This is, I believe, one of the most important things Dorothy did. I mean, she also suggested to Perutz how to do um, the MIR, and she also saw some structures of stuff. But this was really important, because this was the critical insight that enabled macromolecular crystallography. And it's something that haunts us to this day. The crystals she was working with were two millimeters long, giants by modern standards. The volume of that crystal is one and a half microliters altogether. Today, we're working with things that were 100 microns and starting to get big. You know what the volume of a 100 micron crystal is? It's a nanoliter, one nanoliter. 10 micron crystals are picoliters. Now these things were drying out on a time scale of minutes under a microscope. You really think these guys are not drying out at all between your little drop that you've left open on their way to liquid nitrogen? It's quite possible this is the dominant source of non-isomorphism. And I think people who are good at mounting and are very consistent about it tend to not see it. But the rest of us probably do. That's my little theory. But I think Dorothy may, we can still learn a lot from her. Now another thing that's going on to this day is it appears that the volume may have been right. Maybe atoms really are disappearing from the universe. Because <laughs> we all see this, and we argue about whether you should model it in or not model it in. Because, OK, well, if you can't see it, you don't know it's there. But we know it's there. It's, it can't have gone far. So where have the atoms gone? Well, one thing you can do to try and track them down is an MD simulation. I've been doing a little bit of this lately. And this is an MD of an actual protein structure where I'm just plotting the electron density for the terminal nitrogen of this lysine. And so one of my friends, Scott Klassen, calls this a lenticular cloud. But this is the form factor that you should be using for one atom. It's not Gaussian. So in 19, 1914, they had a hard time believing atoms were spread out over space. We're still having a hard time believing that. This isn't quantum mechanical, fortunately. But it's still something that we don't really want to accept because we don't want to be depositing crystal structures that look like NMR structures. But maybe that's <laughs> something we have to start doing. So I played around with this a bit. If you try to fit atoms into that electron density, it's got 24,000 confirmations in it. But if you're satisfied with only 5% error, experimental error for most of us, uh, you only need about 40 atoms to do it. Problem is, the distribution, position, and anisotropic B factor of these atoms has absolutely nothing to do with what's going on in the MD. It's completely uninformative. But you can cheat a bit and use, use the MD to tell you what the rotomer distributions are and fit that to not just one atom but the whole residue. And with only eight conformers, you can get 3% error. Again, this is for one, one amino acid isolated in space. You take, take those atoms from the whole MD, make an electron density map out of it, and then try to fit something to it. That's what I'm doing here. Now, I did this for the whole structure. You range between 2 and 14 conformers. You can stitch them all together. You can actually get R factors against the simulated data. This is not including the solvent, just the protein. But the average electron density for 24,000 conformers, based on an MD, can be represented by only 14 or so. That's not so bad. I've been trying to move forward with this a little bit. I'm not really complete with it. But if you just drop this into the real data, you get, again, R factors that are pretty much like what you usually get with multi-model refinement. They're not that much better than the crystal, uh, than the modeling off of one crystal. And the reason is because of the solvent. You can actually see this. This is real data. Where if you've got, uh, if you use this MD-derived multi conformer model, all the difference features Every single one of them are out in the solvent. Not one is anywhere near the protein. So it's definitely pointing to errors being in that direction. The problem is, how do you model complicated solvent? I'm still struggling with this. I don't have a complete story for you. But I think this might be sort of the way forward in crystallography. Yes, maybe solvent isn't all that interesting. But OK, any biochemical reaction that happens has to go through it. There does appear to actually be structure. This is, again, just recovering the structure of the MD. But if we can model a nucleodynamic simulation with something we can refine against data, maybe we can get it close enough to, to sink it in. Because if we can solve this, if we can bridge the R-factor gap, 
and get small molecule type R factors with real data, then something really magical happens. Right now we're at about 20% error, and 20% of a carbon atom is several electrons. That's why you can't tell the difference between a carbon and a nitrogen. But if you have 5% error, that's less than one electron. It means that at any resolution, you should be able to see single electron changes in one structure versus another, if your model is unbiased or not. So, to be bold, projecting to 2114, what do I think structural biology is going to be like? Will we still be using crystals? I think so. But the data is going to be a lot noisier. And that's because we're now sort of hitting the limits of what we can do with the data we have today. And I always say that when you, if you have noisy data, you need to learn about statistics. And we need to start learning how to apply statistics, I think, to crystallographic data. Averaging is something that destroys resolution. This is something we're running into with free electron lasers. The problem is if your molecule really does dance around as part of its function and you're averaging over that, uh, it doesn't matter if you have to do the averaging one molecule at a time or across the crystal, you still have a resolution problem. So we need to somehow break that nexus. And I believe in 100 years, maybe even only 20 or 30 years, our structures are no longer going to be three-dimensional, they're going to be four-dimensional. It will actually be a simulation that you compare to the data, even one shot at a time. And this is something that we have to do, because even with ultra-fast pulses, you only get two-dimensional projections of things. You get a shadow. You never get three dimensions. You might be able to do two beams at once or something, but in general, the data we're going to be getting is two-dimensional. So we have to augment, afford, compare a four-dimensional model to two-dimensional data. That, I think, is what the future will bring. And also, I think, in deference to my departed supervisor, we've actually did a lot of this work on life below on sigma, contouring down our maps. Uh, once we get the errors down low enough, the errors appear to actually be much lower than we think they are. Uh, there's a lot to be learned about the structures we already have uh, if, if we can learn how to build models for them. So, thank you very much for your attention.
3 is 10 to the minus 14.